women, we should be hiring women in every organization until we get at least 80%. But it could also be 100% because we have so much sexism in our culture and male privilege, and we have to work against those. No one was listening to the women. They were emotional and crazy, a bunch of weird cat ladies, and God, who knows what. Right? So they needed male voices. So this is part of the sexism of the culture. Thank you. All right, so I want to start out with some questions. How many of you have a key person you admire greatly in the movement? Hands up, please. Okay, so how many of you have a man that fills that category? I expect this audience to be a little different, but yeah, okay. How many of you have a woman? Okay, it's different, good. Um, how many of you participate in a group that is led by a man? Led by a woman? Okay, that's much less. Main speaker is a man in your group? Main speaker is a woman? Kind of, well, not quite 50-50. Live in a region or a nation where if there's one person who's really known as the activist or the expert, it's a man, and if it's a woman. Oh, very few on that one. Almost all a man. How many of you know of someone who's been in a relationship in the movement that did not go well? How many of you have never experienced that? No. <laughs> <laughs> As we move along, I think we'll get clear on some of this. Right now, I just want to get some questions on the table, thinking about things that I'm a scholar, things that I have to try to look at. And yeah, that is a good question. And I think if we look at any of these, you know, what's a man and a woman? This is in itself problematic. And we'll get to that. So first of all, I am talking about sexism and male privilege among activists. So that's my focus. And I want to say that I have started an NGO called Tapestry. And I invite uh, people who identify as women in the movement to come and work with me so we can talk about ideas. And uh, I've already had a couple of scholars come, and it's really fun. But you don't need to be a scholar if you're working on a project, if you want to think about ideas. Um, check it out on the website. Uh, it's a way for me to plug in with others. I do an awfully lot of writing on my own. I have done a survey. And this survey is still up and running. It's still happening. If you have not taken the survey, I hope that you will take the survey. It's completely anonymous. I use it for research, writing, and talking. Um, and it takes about 20 minutes. Don't start it until you have time. And at the same website where you can find the link to the survey, you can find um, the testimonials as well. And I'll be using information from the survey and the testimonials in this talk so you'll have a sense of why this is important. All right, before I begin, it's funny how my comments get more and more complicated as I, the complications of our movement, right? So I have to talk about things before I talk about things. So first saying that my cultural background is the United States. So, you know, whatever that means, the, the narrowness of my country, the kind of retro, the, the bigness and kind of indifference, the lack of languages. So that's my background. That's where I come from. And I, I can't really do a presentation without coming from that background, so it's important to put it on the table. Luckily, young people have helped me really break through this horrible idea of binaries and realize that we can't even talk about them. The trouble is I have to talk about them because sexism sits in the middle of binaries. And if we don't want to talk about binaries, it's like saying humans are animals, so we can't do animal activism. Well, we got to. Right, So I have to pull binaries back in, even though they're problematic, so that I can look at sexism. If you've got thoughts on that, I'm interested. Because it's a, it's a prickly little cactus. All right, so for that reason, just as in this movement, we choose things to focus on that we really can't pull out from the bucket of problems, I'm going to focus on sexism. And it's just one of many problems. It's not isolated. Uh, it's integrated with the others. 
but it's what this talk is about, not because I don't recognize there's other problems. I do. But because I can only talk about what I can talk about. And, uh, we, and we do need to look closely at this subject as well. So that's why I'm talking about it. Um, but I do recognize that it is bigger. It's bigger than what I'm talking about. Finally, <clears throat> actually, I think this is not finally. Um, so I, I just want to say, too, that I realize that when I write about this, uh, people get offended, like, like I'm accusing them. I'm not accusing anyone. This is our problem. We're all in it together. I, I can look back at my past. I can look back at my very recent past to be mortified at things I've said and done. I'm part of the problem, especially for things like racism. But I'm also a problem with sexism. We all are, because it's systemic, because we learn it, because we live it, because our lives have to be a process of trying to unravel these problems and work them through. So I am by no means pointing fingers or saying that these people are fine and these ones are not. We're all in this together, and I think we have to look at it with that spirit if we're going to solve the problem. I think this is the final thing I want to say um, in the preliminaries, and that's that this is research. This is not just my opinion. This is me reading a whole lot of stuff about social justice activism and sexism. This is me doing a survey and taking testimonials. So I'm putting together a lot of materials that are out there because it's always been the case for years we've said, oh, there's sexism in the movement, sexism in the movement. And almost no one did any real studies where we could look at them and then talk about the subject. So with the help of others, um, we're starting to gather some information, and that's what I will present today. Definitions, words matter. How we speak matters, what we say matters. Looking at our words, looking at what they mean, right? We all know that because people talk about things like, especially in Montana where I live, they talk about livestock, right? Living beings on a shelf for exploitation is what I hear, but it's a very common word. So we have to look at our language because it records our culture and it perpetuates our culture. So if we don't want that to be perpetuated, we have to look at the language that's recording our ways of understanding. So I tend to use uh, animal ethics to talk about the organizations, the communities, the activism, because it's, there's liberationists, there's welfareists, there's animal rights people, and I need to include them all in this because they're all included in this. I use perpetrator, not predator, because I like predators. Predators are a lovely thing, and we don't want to put a bad smear on the lovely beings who, as it were, have no choice but to eat other beings. So I use perpetrator. Uh, we talk about intersectional justice. I tend to use overlapping or interconnected because the word intersectional uh, comes from the black legal scholars and the work that they've done. And p some people of color have been very offended, and rightly so, me included, who started using this term before I really understood it and have misused it and, and uh, in a method of kind of appropriation, have used it for our own purposes. Language is lovely. There are many terms. So if I'm offending, I don't want to offend, and there's no reason. So I pick these other terms, and it all works out well. All right, so the last three, we're going to look at a little more in depth. And I want to, I often use the term animal. It means any animal other than the speaker. I don't like the othering that goes on with language. So this is what I try to do to get away from that. I, it, when I'm writing, it's especially important for me. Uh, when I speak, which I do much less often than I write, I have to try to think it through because I don't use it as often speaking, but I will try to do so. Uh, because it's important that we not other or perpetuate dualisms uh, and that we keep it simple. All right, so what is my plan? Here is my plan. I'm going to begin with the bigger picture. I want to look at social justice activism generally because this is not just our problem. This is a bigger problem. And then I want to focus in on uh, our movement in particular. I want to look at the harms that are caused, and I want to propose some possible solutions. So I hope that we will get to do so. I'll be looking for all of your input. I feel I often work in a cave, and it's nice to be out 
uh, to share the ideas and see what others have to say. So if we're going to talk about sexism and male privilege, we should probably have a peek at them. What are they? So it's a form of systemic oppression. And uh, sexism is a way by which females end up having a negative bias as opposed to males. And so there's a prototype, and you can see the prototype there on the left, and the not prototype on the right. And this is why when you look at medicine, we had a hard time figuring out when women were having heart attacks because the female body wasn't what used. It isn't explored. This is why when you see pictures of evolution and we're coming up from the apes, what emerges is a white man, right? So this is our, our prototype that we use all the time in the cultures from which I come in the United States, and I think in many others as well. Male privilege stems from this. So if you have sexism and women are denigrated, then the prototype is going to be given advantages. And you can see these in lots of ways. Um, in my country, which I think is particularly embarrassing on this point and many others, uh, we, if you look at our judicial system, if you look at our police, uh, if you look at pretty much anybody with powers, I went through a philosophy degree, clear to a doctorate, I never had a woman as a teacher. So they, the people of power tend to be men, and they, uh, they, they don't come there because they happen to be better at philosophy than women are. They aren't in the police force because somehow they're better at being police people than women. And they aren't in our Supreme Court because somehow women are not appropriate for the job. It's through male privilege, which gifts them with an expectation from birth. I remember my brother saying to me once when I was a little kid, I can be president, but you can't. And it stuck. I knew he was right, but I also knew he was wrong. So this is just what we grow up with. As a teacher, in my classrooms, the, the males are always fastest to speak. They, they feel ready to say. They feel confident to speak. Um, and to some sense, there's an entitlement to that. Um, when I teach feminist classes, I sometimes will ask a man to please wait. And I, I did this with one who just was, he was like a dog on a bone. Uh, when as soon as I'd come up with a question, he was there with an answer. And I said, you know, if you wait, you'll hear some other points of view. He said, do you think so? <laughs> and he actually came back to me. He really didn't believe it. He thought they didn't have anything to say. They didn't know the answers. And he said to me, you're right. When I, and he was clearly disappointed. But I, you know, it's probably the most important thing he learned from the class, that if you, if you back off a little bit, women pause before they speak. So this is all part of male privilege. It's all part of things that we're so used to that we don't notice them. But we have to start noticing them because they are causing larger problems. Uh, that when men are... are that when men have these privileges, they create, in the end, a dysfunctional social justice systems, and that's kind of what we have come to. The men end up having the wealth, the power, they're expected to be the people of knowledge. They take the positions of power, they are the spokespersons, and as you will see from the information I've gathered, this is in itself problematic. All right, so let's begin with the bigger picture. This is really important to me because it allows us to take a deep breath and not be defensive. This isn't just us. This is a bigger problem. All right, so in social justice activism generally, there are a preponderance of males as leaders, and not just a little, but a lot, right? I looked up the 10 biggest organizations, and one of them had a woman at the helm. Methods. Uh, direct action, militant, aggressive, and the use of reason. These are the ones that are put forward. We all know, I think, pretty well by now that the use of reason isn't that effective. We need to touch people's hearts. We need to give them personal experiences. Um, but the male methods have been, on the left side, if you'll remember the prototype, is reason. So it's emphasized, and it's given greater value. And so are anything that requires mechanical skills or physical ability. These are the things that are envisioned as 
uh, superior methods or the more important or the more, uh, the more impressive. These are the impressive methods of activism. And this, this isn't just us. This is, these are scholars looking at how uh, social justice activists work and what they value and why. And of course, we all know that activism is a many and varied being and that really most of what we do isn't that glamorous. Certainly from my standpoint, because I spend a lot of time sitting at a desk typing, but really any action requires this background work, the connections, uh, the writing. We do lobbying, we do leafleting. But organizations do a thing called frames and framing. And when they make these frames, they have a specific purpose. So if you're uh, kind of, we look at the environmental organization, they want to attract new members. So if you want to attract new members to your group, do you want it to look like a feminist group? What do you think? Do you think if you're an environmentalist and you're already on the fringes because you're going into environmentalism, are you going to say we're a feminist group and we're environmentalists? Right? So this isn't how it works. What people have figured out is if they frame their organization inside the mainstream, then they can resonate with people. And when they resonate with people, they will bring activists in. And obviously, that's what they want. They need members, and they need people to say, oh, this is a legitimate group. It looks familiar to me. I feel comfortable here. So frames and framing are one of the methods. Whoops, I think I hit the wrong button. There we go. And this is probably the most insidious beast. Ooh, catch myself with language. Beasts are good. Beasts are delightful. This is the most insidious, and I'm not sure why I stuck that picture right in the middle of the writing, but you can't have everything. Of the two mistakes, the beast one is far worse. All right, we like the beasts. So inside facing loyalty, in my studies, is the one that really nails us. All right, so we, anytime you have an activist group, you have a smaller group within a group. You have a sense that your group, your little group, is the good, the good people. You're the ones that have the, the moral high ground. And that your cause is the most important cause, because if you didn't think that, you'd go over and join the other group. Right? So you're with the cause that you think has the most important uh, agenda. And then, you need to know, too, that activism feeds our needs. People don't join uh, social justice organizations without an expectation. So what we get back from it is a sense of purpose. We get community. We have a sense of pride and accomplishment. So these are all important to how social justice causes work. So people join, and whoever is in the group, especially if they're new, they will look up to people who have been in groups for a long time. They'll look up to leaders. They'll look up to spokespersons. And in the end, those who do militant or direct actions, or who are viewed as saviors of the forests, of the poor, champions of the cause, uh, against climate change, for the earth, for children. So this brings a sense of heroism to the leaders who happen to be males. Right, so this gives them a tremendous power within social justice organizations. Again, it's across the board. Now, if we look just at our community, interestingly, we have a more so effect. We are actually a smaller community within the larger community. Right? So if you look at the various things that people could be doing that everyone would be happy about you doing, protecting a chicken isn't one of them. Right? So we're really on the margins. And if you look at this caricature done by somebody clearly not fond of our movement, you see that they've caught on that it's largely women. And it probably comes from my country because we have this phobia about hairy legs. But look at how the, the bull, look at the aggressiveness of these animals. Right? These aren't the animals that we know. They even put a lobster in there with gigantic pinchers, right? crawling along waiting to get you. Remarkable. Right, so we are viewed, uh, we have a very, the AE community isn't like these other ones. We're not viewed in the same way. 
So we are more isolated and we are smaller. So with our frames and framing, what do we do? We try to look normal, right? Or even more than normal. Okay? But this is what we really look like, right? Right? So that sexism and that male privilege is in that literature. It's in those attempts to appeal to the majority, to try to fit in. And of course, we have male leadership because male voices have knowledge. And interestingly, so PETA uh, originally, obviously Ingrid Newkirk, strong, competent woman, but there was a point in the history of PETA when they sought men because they needed voices of reason. No one was listening to the women. They were emotional and crazy, a bunch of weird cat ladies and God, who knows what. Right? So they needed male voices. So this is part of the sexism of the culture. If you're going to appeal to a sexist culture, you better get a man up there with a microphone. They're the ones who know things. And if you can, put a white coat on them. Then they really know things. All right, now we have gendered methods, right? Whoops, okay, another not so well done one. How many of you have been out with the <clears throat> sledgehammer lately? Right? So again, and we're all proud of this part of our movement, I think. And reason, certainly, some of the ones we recognize as founders were men who used reason, even though women using emotion came before them and working on legislation, especially against anti-vivisection, or against vivisection. So we have the gendered methods thing going on for absolute sure, and I can, beyond a shadow of doubt, see this in myself, if I look back over the years, and it's something I would still fight. I'm a liberationist to the core. I might be more apt to use a sledgehammer than any of you, because I, I'm in Montana. Again, this is what we really look like. We hand out leaflets and, you know, rescue needy beings and uh, carry signs and do lobbying and get together and talk about what we're going to do next. And we, again, this is the one. If you can't remember anything else I've said, please remember this. This is a problem. We have, because we're a little community, because the rest of the world thinks we're whacked out and weird, we have a very, very strong inside-facing loyalty. And I think, too, because of the beings that we serve, uh, we have a very strong inside-facing loyalty. Uh, and it's very dangerous. <clears throat> um, and I have said it many times in my decades of activism, that the, the animals come first, that I'd do anything for the cause, that I'd take a hit any day of the week and now I see how wrong-headed that is. And we have to not do that. We have, to, we have to do things. We have to live what we're talking about. We can't try to shove it under the rug if it doesn't look quite right, because we have an aim that we're loyal to, because in the end, it hurts the cause. It's not loyal. All right, so next we look at the harms. And here I start adding some of the quotes from the survey and from testimonials, because I think it's one of the strongest ways to really see what's going on. So uh, I mentioned this morning the case with HSUS, that quietly women working behind the scenes one of the problems with this case is so much money, the lawyers that were paid, the distraction, the hurt, the pain. Uh, we can't be activists when we're spending our time in the courtroom trying to figure out uh, who did what and, and what we're going to do about it. We need to solve this problem. It's been going on a very long time. We need to solve this problem. So activism, remember I mentioned that it's needs fulfillment. So if this is needs fulfillment, and 80% of activists are female, and they are dealing, certainly in my country, and certainly in many organizations, many of the biggest organizations that are run by men, if they are dealing with sexual harassment and sexual assault, and they are, are their needs being fulfilled? 
Are they going to want to stay in the, in the movement? Are they going to be able to apply themselves fully to the movement? Activism requires self-confidence. I know it because I always feel like a target when I'm up here, like a big bullseye, right? But I have to come up here anyway. We have to talk about these things. So these, these are some of the women that we have speaking here. They need to have the confidence and the space to get up and say something. And to do that, we have to be sure that, they are, that, they are, that everyone in the movement is empowered and treated with respect. <clears throat> so through this, through talking about this, through studying this, through recognizing the damage is done, we can see that you can't help the animals if you are harming people in the movement. 9% of those who took the survey have left the movement. 9%. That is huge, especially given that I don't know how they found out about the survey. Right? If I could tap into people who had left, I hate to think how big that number would go. And this is all over the world. I've had people uh, writing in. This part is the survey and the testimonials are uh, completely international. This quote, mostly these experiences have just damaged me and my life. They have taken away my confidence and strength in the movement. They have left me filled with no self-esteem, no confidence to work with, and full of self-hatred. Isn't that sad? It breaks my heart. All right, so we have to change this. We have to not let this happen to our activists. It's not OK. But there's hope. There are things we can do. There are solutions. And I hope that you will come up with even more of them. First one, hire women. Right, so my, first, my survey shows that only 5% of those who were harassed or, or experienced sexual assault had it from people who were, had less power than they did. So what's the obvious conclusion? Women are in leadership positions, and it is true. I find that organizations run by women, I'm not hearing from problems within those organizations. It's organizations run by men. And then the male networks that perpetuate the power among men, believing that they are the best speakers, that they are the best leaders, when studies show, and I've read them, that if you ask employees, women are the best leaders. So. Uh, an interesting, an, an interesting another part of my research has been noticing that what we're doing actually isn't benefiting our movement in the sense that women uh, tend to be the better leaders. So we need to put them in leadership positions. And again, if we're 80% women, we should be hiring women in every organization until we get at least 80%. And then if you, and then, you know, it could be an 80-20, but it could also be 100% because we have so much sexism in our culture and male privilege, and we have to work against those we have to protect our organization and the world and try to empower uh, and root out the sexism and the male privilege that are hurting people and the movement and cultures in generally, pe general, people, people in society in general. So standing with survivors is a problem. I see it again and again. Now, this has to do with inside-facing loyalty. So Rachel Perman of Tofurky, absolutely fabulous human being. Uh, posted this letter to HSUS that said, hey, we're hearing endless reports coming out of there that you got sexism and male privilege going on, and there's, we need to do something about it. This was the response from one of the board members. Are you out of your mind? Don't you have anything better to do in life than air your repressed sexual fantasies in public? All right, now I understand this in context. This person, this board member, is protecting an organization that is protecting animals. Animals, sorry. So that's how she sees it. That's her understanding. I've been there. I get it. And I, I got nothing against this person, personally. It's a matter of education. It's a matter of understanding. It's a matter of recognizing systemic oppression and the fact that you can't fix one if you can't fix them all. We can't uh, perpetuate one and expect to solve another. <clears throat> the policies, from the answers I'm getting, aren't working. Many simply don't have policies. 
Others with male leadership, they just ignore the policy when it suits them. I heard this again and again from respondents in the survey. So we need education about what sexual harassment is, what sexual assault is, uh, where the lines are, what discrimination is, and we need policies that are posted and we need people enforcing them. If you are a donor, a member, or a volunteer, and you're the org an organization does not have a policy, or you hear more than one report of sexual harassment, walk. There's lots of great organizations out there. All right, this is a hard one. We need to rethink our relationships. So if we have an 80-20 ratio of women to men, what's that going to mean in relationships? Who has the power? Who has the power? You bet they do. Uh, and so this is problematic. And I get that we're close with people we work with, and we love our vegans. But for heterosexuals in this movement, this is a really dangerous situation. If you're going to do it, be careful. And know your odds. Know what you're playing with. We need to get rid of the idea of heroes and he-men. None of this nonsense about, you know, this one's the, you know, the great savior of the movement. But recognizing that we, we're all part of this, that nothing happens without everybody behind the scenes working, that every cog in the wheel is needed, and the heroism that we're, that we're providing to especially men of power has become dangerous to our movement, especially in my country, but again, I hear it from all over. So uh, it is not just the United States. Here's a few others that I've listed that I won't talk much about, but I think are part of the picture. Uh, if, someone, if someone is waiting for you to clear the table and you're a, a woman, don't do it. Just sit there. Make sure that you are not expected to be the one taking notes. Last time I checked, we've all got hands. And if someone is going to be the chair of a committee, if you're a woman, step forward. You can do it, and you know it. And don't pause, because if you do, you know what's going to happen. So work against these tendencies. And we have to work, as I say, we are in the United States, we have to work against perpetrators. We can do it quietly. Uh, and I think we have to do it quietly to be safe. And no one needs to know who's doing it, uh, except the ones on the inside. And we need allies, but be wary. I have definitely seen some allies who were just enjoying the added connections with women by saying they were feminists. So we need allies, but not that kind, really. And this one was mentioned this morning. Women need to organize, and yes, we need spaces just for those who identify as women. Um, and if you look at this quote, you'll see why. And I can confirm for you that there's no question that uh, when I'm with my woman friends, the conversation is different than when one man walks in the room. I can tell you as a teacher that when I have a group of, uh, group of students and it's a, group, uh, it's a feminist class, you add one man to that classroom and it's a different class. So the dynamic is different, the topics are different, and if we need, if, if, if we're going to feel safe to expose this stuff, we need spaces to do it in. When I went to college, my first, I must not have been there more than a, less than a month, the first year in college, there was a group post at Harambe. I thought, oh, I'm going, how exciting. So I showed up. It was a group of people of color, and they threw my ass out of the room. And it hurt, and I didn't understand it. But I do now. I say good for them. Okay, they could have understood that I was an idiot, and I could, they, could have, they could have done it a little nicer and just said, look, you don't get it, but here's the deal. Uh, but they literally threw me out of the room because they knew they needed their own space. That one white person in the room wrecked their space. The other thing is to remember to hold on to your friends and to look after them and to protect them. This is my friend Alex. That's us about 30 years ago. We were rescuing a turkey. And this is us this summer. We got together and just spent some time that these, these, this is priceless, right? She's gone the path with me 
from being a complete idiot to a marginal idiot, right? We, we recognize we're still, we get together to talk about how incredibly dumb the things were that we've done, and that we know we st we're still not there, that it's a learning process, and that we're all in this together. But that standing by one another for us has been really important. She works with vegan outreach now, and because of that, I know they have a really strong feminist working on their policies and uh, keeping them clean, and that's important to me. I like to see a woman in a high place in our organizations because I know so much about the problems that we're having. Notice this quote, how it's right out of the stuff I've talked about, that need for community, that kind of desperation that you can hear in this voice, and that fear that at the end of the day, what really matters isn't her and how badly she's been treated in the sexism, but the movement. She doesn't understand that they're connected. So I think the most important thing is to recognize that we have a problem, but we're part of a bigger problem, and the bigger problem is connected to the cultures. So there's no getting around it. There is sexism and male privilege, and they are in social justice activism, and they are in our movement, and they're there pretty strongly. And here's a voice, again, that, you know, it, it just it hurts to know somebody's facing racism and sexism to the point where it's hard to be an activist. And I know that none of us in this room want that. So again, I want to say to you, if you want to take this survey, here's how you find it. And if you want to leave testimonials, please do so. I need data, and all of you are in the movement, so please. Um, help me collect this data. I'm putting it together. It will be out in a book probably in about a year, but it's taking a lot of time, and uh, I'm going to need legal advice for this one, which I didn't for any of my others. <clears throat> so I see those who, who deny male privilege. They're kind of like the climate change people, like, no, it's not happening. Look at all this evidence. Did I really need to do the survey? I think almost anyone who's been in the movement any length of time has seen some of this stuff and knows it's going on. But I also see these voices as something like those we talk to who just are like, la, 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 no, no, no suffering, no pain, it's not happening, right? It's like, I don't want to see it. I, don't, I, I like my meat and my cheese. I don't want to know that there's an individual being on the other end of it. But if we're going to ask others to change, we need to be able to change and willing and ready to change. We have to be educable. I have to be. And I'm old, so it's harder to get something into my brain. But I'm working on it. And we all have to work on it. I know my brain, nothing sticks quite like it used to. But I also know that my breadth of perspective, perspective has grown. So there's advantages there too. I encourage you to be kind, be kind. Remember that we are a movement of compassion. This is not about calling someone out. This is about calling people in. Because all of us in areas and ways are ignorant, all of us hurt others, and we want to call people in and help them see, just as I would hope we would, we would want to be called in, I want to be called in, I want to understand when I've done something stupid or hurtful, so that I can understand it and change it. But we also need to be firm, we need to not be afraid. And I tell you, I feel like a, a bullseye up here, I do. There's a lot of anger around this issue. There's a lot of privilege that doesn't want to change. There's a lot of men of power. There's a lot of women who will protect the movement at any cost and will stand up for men, especially if they're asked to or called to, will readily stand up for these heroes. As if somehow, I don't know, it's as if the woman who's being battered in her own, in her house, if the neighbor says, no, he's never battered me, that he's innocent. Right? And I feel this way when we try to get some woman in the movement to say, no, no, he's innocent. Well, just because he's never done anything to you doesn't mean he's innocent. 
And I think if you have more than one person accusing, look carefully. Stand by women. And if it's the first person to accuse and you're skeptical, then just be quiet. Because people who step forward are brave. It is not easy. And I don't know anybody in this movement who would do it unless they felt they had to. <clears throat> I hope that you will look, take these issues seriously. And I hope that you will try to do it with the same spirit that we would hope others would take on the challenge of animal liberation. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Subscribe to this channel and ask yourself, if you're wanting others to change, are you willing to change? Leave your comments below.